Look at what happens here. We intuitively know that in a community we feel connected with people. So some of these people are closely connected, aren't they? And some are more distant. This could be a map of where people live. Right? We feel closer to those we see more fast and more distant. Uh, and these connections give us a sense of identity where the bun and yong crowd, where the, uh, I don't know, where else crowd, right? But the problem is social life is very complex. There are lots of other dimensions. So when we talk about Collingwood, we'll see a division occur. And people uh, in Bun and Yong, some vote for, Co for Collingwood and some don't. So they feel much closer to the Collingwood barriers that are down at the Eureka Stock Age than they do to their neighbours. So can you see that we could layer over this any kind of the dimensions of political and social life and economic and occupational interest, even in psychology we've got different theoretical frameworks and we've got gender, we've got all sorts of different factors that uh, come in and out of salience in actually aligning us with closer or more looser connections, haven't we? So can you imagine that what we um, are embedded in is a multi-dimensional crystal lattice where each dimension represents some kind of dimension of social organisation. And we know how to negotiate this because we map it in our own mind. That's uh, what gives us the feeling of belonging. It, were you the Collingwood person? We wish you never said that. See, she made a noise. Now, we all know Thanks. what to expect about her. <laughs> Because we know where Collingwood fits. Can you see? Thank you. Um, right now, it is a very, in my opinion, it's a very important resilience factor that we have complex identities, many different features of identities. So, what's your name? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's Anne. Anne. So. Anne goes into crisis when Collingwood would lose another grand final. <laughs> <laughs> 1990 last time. But hang on a second. There's an election coming up. At least she can hope that, uh, let's say, the uh, One Nation gets in. But damn it, they don't get in either. But hang on. She's a guilt-ridden Catholic, so she can go to Mass. That would be all right. Can you see how adversity that challenges our identity in one dimension allows us to fall back on other parts of our identity, right? Or we've got our family that we know love us and uh, we all, you know, there's everything else has gone on we don't see our families. So let's imagine that that's our uh, resilient multi-dimensional social fabric. These lines represent the bonds bonds, social bonds, social relationships. What is the manifest and material content of social relationships? What do they consist of? Because we haven't got much time, I won't put the thumb screws, screws on and extract ideas. But just think about it for a moment. What do you think it is? Communication. Communication is the raw material of relationships. Without communication, we can't have a relationship because we have no connection. Now, it took me 10 years to get away from information theory and realise it's the fact of communication that's far more important than the content. Information theory says it's all about information content. No, it's about the fact of it. That outweighs content Think about when you've been out for uh, dinner with nice friends and you've had a really lovely evening and you talked complete rubbish the whole evening. <laughs> and you could have talked a completely different load of rubbish and had just as good a time and come away feeling close and warm and supportive and empathic. Right? So we've got to be clear that content of communication is a luxurious additional element. And here's the important thing. If we say communication is the raw material 
of social relationships and then we can say is the substance of social fabric, then that's a very simple step because now we can say communication is always physical, isn't it? Communication is always physical. It's a very simple idea unless we go to mental telepathy. Right. We'll leave that out. We can bring that in later. But, but communication is physical. It has to be, doesn't it? Right? Have you got that? It's a very simple idea. Gesture, proximity, sound, uh, you know? It's physical. Therefore, we can observe it. At the moment, we learn to observe communication as fact, not as content. We're observing social fabric. And secondly, we can intervene in it by entering the communicational process so we can work with social fabric. And thirdly, we can diagnose damage to social fabric by looking at damage to communication processes. So the social doesn't become some mysterious external something or other that people come inside their heads. No, it is a material process of communication which we can observe and deal with. But we have to get away from content and we have to observe, learn to observe. So yep. just that, where does, um, say, communicating on Facebook or email fit in with that? Just another means. Yeah. But it's more about content, though, isn't it, in that sense? Uh, an email I'm not saying that content is irrelevant. No, no, no. I'm, just I'm saying, saying what's more important is that they are in content. Yeah. What will be important for them is whether the girl says uh, this in her email or that. But what is factual is that he's in relationship with her. Yeah. Right? And, and that's a bond. Therefore, he's affected by what she does. It's not so important whether she's happy or sad. He's bound to her as part of his community. That's a secondary thing as well, the content is. So yes, but you see, if the, if the computer system goes down, he doesn't know what she thinks about it. Uh, right? So that's the physicality of it. Because uh, we're going to follow this through. We're going to look at communication. That's the thing to learn to look at. Because whenever you get disruption of communication, you get damage to social fabric, damage to bondedness. Uh, and a lot of things go wrong 